So in here I've got a jar. This is called my, a killing jar. It's got it labelled killing jar. At the bottom of it I've got plaster of Paris. That's because it absorbs the liquid that I put in there while it turns into a gas. This is our killing fluid here. I only need a tiny drop of this in there and this is sealed, it's airtight. It's quite small, the killing jar, because obviously I want to kill these insects as quick as possible. It's, it's not something that I take any pleasure in and I want it done as um, ethically, correctly and quickly as I possibly can. They will actually be dead within, within seconds. Entomologist Sally Ann Spence uses a traditional killing jar to kill the dung beetles she collects for her studies. Other insect scientists pop their subjects into the deep freeze, while some of us go for death by alcohol. We'd like them to make a very simple wasp trap and hang it up in their garden and then send us their wasps. OK, so how do we do that? Well, all you need is... This is my colleague Syrian uh, Sumner from University College London on BBC One's Country File at the end of last summer. She was launching our big wasp survey, a nationwide citizen science project we devised to survey the distribution and abundance of the UK's eight species of social wasp. About half a can of lager in the bottom, so about 200 mils. So yeah. that's ready to go, so the that's wasps should be flooding into they this. They will flood into that. So wasps are going to die in the name of science, does that bother you at all? Um, not really, because the impact that these traps are going to have on wasp populations will be negligible. We were very excited. We don't actually know that much about how social wasps are being affected by environmental change. But we do know that they're very important, as pollinators and as predators of pests. But with bees getting all the media attention, and wasps being, well, not exactly popular, wasp research doesn't generally get much of a look in. We believed we could get some new, important data. But the headlines in some national newspapers told us that not everyone was as excited about the project as we were. Conservationists slam hateful survey promoting wasp killing. Public urged to drown wasps in beer in bizarre conservation project. Criticism and abuse on social media rapidly followed, although plenty of scientists were quick to jump to our defence. The negative reaction to what I've always regarded as absolutely vital, the killing of insects to collect and study them, was a bit of a shock. It got me thinking, can we really defend the deaths of millions of insects for the sake of science? Indeed, does the science ever justify what some on social media described as the slaughter? especially when we're so concerned about insect conservation. How do we feel about killing our subjects? And might insects themselves be feeling something akin to pain? To begin to answer some of these questions, I visited the lab at University College London to which members of the public have sent the wasps they trapped in the first week of last September. So inside this freezer, we can just have a look. You can see it's full of envelopes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, full Very of envelopes cool. that have all been sent by people from all over the country. And if we just take one out, for example, we can see that they've got the trap number and I can look at that on our database and see exactly where in the country that's come from. Peggy Bevin and Susie Warnock are students working with Siri and Sumner to identify the different species in 2,000 or so trap content sent in. Unfortunately, these mass surveys are something you just can't do with live wasps. Okay. Definitely some wasps in here. So I just uh, will pick it out with some forceps to try and separate it from the a few of the flies that are in there. Can you identify them for us, or do you need a bit more a bit more work with these? I think that one is vulgaris. It has the anchor-shaped mark. Yeah, because you need to get up close, don't you, and actually yeah. look at the features to, to see which, somewhere? which of course is going to be very difficult to do with a, a live wasp. Yeah, there's no, yeah, hand. absolutely no way that I'd be able to identify them if they were I'd be live. Too scared as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the questions we had from um, people inquiring about the big wasp survey. Couldn't we ask them to send in photos instead? Hmm. I'd love to be able to say yes, but sadly, the quality of the photo that you could get from a, a live wasp passing through your garden is just not good enough. And also, even though the face markings are quite indicative of the species, you do need to verify the markings on the back of the thorax as well in order to be 100% certain of the species identity. Insects are small and tricky to identify. To get the data we needed, we had to have the wasps from all over the UK under a microscope. So what was the big problem that people had with our survey? 
Chief among our critics was Matt Shardlow, Chief Executive of the invertebrate conservation charity Bug Life. I guess the two main things that worried us about that project was that it started with a slogan that said that it was harnessing the hatred of the British public for the wasp and as an organisation that doesn't hate wasps that was quite difficult for us to stomach. We think that we should be trying to encourage people to understand and tolerate and live alongside wasps rather than get into conflict situations. So that was a, a difficult phrase to deal with and I think it got us I think, off onto the wrong foot. We took your point on board about harnessing the hatred in fact, we, we got rid of that strap line before that website went public. Um, we then uh, had a hard look at the uh, scientific rationale for the project uh, because when you're looking at killing life, insects or any other animals, we think that that should be carefully justified. So there's no absolutes here. There are grey areas. And in in that grey area, you know, we would say if you've got a really good reason for killing the invertebrates, for instance, if killing that invertebrate means you can then save 100,000 other invertebrates, then as Spock on Star Trek might say, you know, the, the value of that one life has to give way to the value of the many other lives. But in this case, when we looked at the reasons why insects were going to be killed, primarily wasps, but also other things, the scientific rationale didn't seem carefully enough worked out for us to believe that the outcome in terms of data and knowledge justified the amount of killing of insects that would be going on. Naturally, we didn't agree with Matt. For example, we minimised the impact on wasp populations by surveying at a time of year when the wasps flying around were likely to be non-reproductive worker wasps towards the end of their lives, rather than next year's queens. In total, we estimate the project caught, as we predicted, about the same number of workers you'd find in two nests. To put that into context, pest controllers every year destroy thousands of nests in people's roofs and sheds. While the big wasp survey might have had its detractors for killing a few thousand insects, one of the most reported and lauded scientific discoveries of last year entailed the deaths of millions. Scientists in Germany have reported what they describe as an alarming drop in the population of flying insects. They found you might remember it. Research over the last quarter of a century in Germany revealed a staggering 75% decline in the overall mass of flying insects. Dave Goulson of the University of Sussex was one of the authors. This is really serious. You know, insects are vitally important. They make up the bulk of life on Earth. They do all sorts of things that we can't do without, like pollinating, being food for, for most birds and bats and so on. So if that study hadn't taken place, we'd be sitting here with no idea quite what a crisis was looming. But to find out that insects were declining so dramatically required insect death on a grand scale. More than 50 kilograms worth died in the course of the study. The way the, the insects were sampled was using a thing called a malaise trap, or actually dozens of malaise traps dotted all over Germany. A malaise trap, it looks a bit like a two-man ridge tent. It's basically a couple of poles and a load of netting, and insects bump into it as they're flying about. And when they hit it, they tend to they hit the netting, they tend to walk upwards, and it's kind of designed at the top a bit like a lobster pond. They fall into a pot of alcohol, and they die. They catch pretty much all flying insects, so butterflies, moths, bees, wasps, flies, all sorts of things. So the, the entomologist puts the trap up, and then he just comes back 24 hours later and empties the pot. Personally, I hate malaise traps because they catch so much, but... In this instance, the data that have been produced are, are incredibly important and valuable and have caused people around the world to sit up and notice. And to try and take some perspective on it, the, the number of insects we killed would be an infinitesimally small proportion of the number of insects in Germany. Much as it makes me uncomfortable killing one insect if you don't have to, there are times when I think you just have to accept that the benefit outweighs the harm so long as you're careful in how you design your experiment and you minimise the harm. A chilly January day is not ideal for collecting insects, but I did stand some chance on the downland pasture of Wiltshire in the company of Sally Ann Spence. The sheep are all going to run over the other side now, quite not. There are cattle in this field, very little Dexter cattle. And where there are cow pats and sheep dung, there should be dung beetles. This is quite fresh dung, but in the summertime, 
fresh dung would already be colonised straight away by dung flies and other, other insects coming straight in. But uh, what I'm doing is I'm picking up some dung and I'm hand, what we call hand searching it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're picking through it with your fingers. I'm basically. literally picking yeah, through it with my fingers. So I've got some gloves on. We do have winter active dung beetles, which is what I'm looking for. When I think of dung beetles, I'm generally thinking of big black sort of scarab beetles, basically. You're picking through this dung in quite fine detail. Are we we're looking for something a little bit different from what I'm imagining? The real big chunky scarab beetles that you're talking about we have, they tend to live in tunnels underneath the dung. Most of our dung beetles, actually our biggest group of dung beetles, actually live in the dung itself. How many different species of dung beetle have we got here in the UK? Well, we've got over 40 different species of dung beetle, and I'm not going to be exact because the problem we've got with dung beetles is we don't know actually how well they're doing. We know that some are definitely getting rarer than others. We're presuming some are now extinct because we cannot find them at the moment. But this is the beginning of a project that we're setting up just to basically understand how many dung beetles we've got, what their population frequencies are, where they are in the UK and what state they're in. So we can, we've got a, basically a data sort of foundation line to understand more about the species. This is an ongoing survey run by Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Dung beetles are very useful insects. They're the first step in getting the nutrients bound up in dung back into the ecosystem. With less dung hanging around for less time, it's also less able to harbour parasites that can harm our livestock. But each dung beetle species has a different niche and a subtly different ecological role, which is why Sally Ann needs to collect and identify at multiple sites around the country. Now, some species she can ID at the cowpat, but others she has to take back to the lab, where the beetles go into the killing jar we met earlier. Then it's under the microscope for identification, which can be rather more involved and X-rated than you might think. It doesn't always stop on the external factors of a beetle. With dung beetles, as with many beetles, they basically can have very different willies from each other as well. So sometimes it may be necessary to remove that willy, and because the willy comes out of the body, it's got an exoskeleton, which means it doesn't de degrade with the rest of the soft tissues. We have books full of drawings, very, very... Uh, graphic, if you like, very specific drawings of dung beetle willies. I can possibly tell the different species by that. I cannot, unfortunately, do that with the animal alive. Once you've identified that animal, what happens to its body then? Its body is not thrown away. That's one thing that, that's really, really important. That, that animal is then mounted on, on a pin. Pins were put in after the animals are dead. And we use the pin for many reasons, because that specimen is going to be kept for infinity. So that individual will be kept on a pin, and it will have its immediate data attached to that pin. So that individual is literally with its data within the museum facility. But I do need to have those individuals because I need to be absolutely 100% certain of what species it is. Because it can be looking very similar to another beetle, but inhabit and have an effect on a totally different part of, of the environment around it. And these specimens are, are kept for infinity and they can be accessed for many different uses. So it might be somebody who's studying the effects of that particular species on parasites in livestock and breaking down the dung, or it could be for climatical change, or it can be for a myriad of reasons and more reasons in the future that I might not have thought of now in my lifetime. Whoever comes back in 50 years time into that collection can actually access the individual that I picked up in that field and all the data I've had that day when I collected it it is there, it is definite, hard evidence, and that's really important for the baseline of data. We don't know what we're losing until we know what we've got. That's a message that echoes all around the vast entomology department at London's Natural History Museum. Just the beetle collection contains around 10 million specimens. As it stands, there are about 400,000 different beetle species described by scientists, but according to senior beetle curator Max Barclay, there are many more out there to be discovered. The bodies of species new to science are coming into the museum all the time, and these specimens are particularly important. Max showed me some of the latest from a recent West African expedition. Running down the middle of the tray here are the most amazing looking, well, weevils I'm guessing, but they're beautiful ruby red iridescence with these turquoise kind of green lines across them. They're one of the most beautiful beetles I've ever seen. I noticed they have a red label under them. Is that significant? The red label is very significant actually. This indicates that those are type specimens. 
and a type specimen is the original specimen of a new species. So if you or I were to describe a species as new to science, we'd have to publish a paper explaining why it was new, and that would have to be peer-reviewed by the scientific community. So you'd set out your reasons that it's new, and you'd label some specimens up as type specimens, which are the ones that you had in front of you when you described the new species. So if you wanted to know what I was talking about when I gave a name to a species, in 100 years' time, when I'm dead, you can go back and look at my type specimens, and you can say, oh, that's what he had in mind. That's what he meant when he said it has a yellow stripe on its head. It, he meant that sort of yellow stripe and not this sort of yellow stripe. So the type specimens are the vouchers of the new species and back up that set of characters that define that new species in a public institution where they can be consulted for all time. For Max Barclay, the collection of insects by institutions like the Natural History Museum is really a race against time to build up an archive of our vanishing biodiversity. Unfortunately, human influence is spreading over the planet at a very great rate. The population is rising, of course, and... um, the amount of natural habitat is going to decrease. And I always think of it as almost one is is working with an art gallery which is on fire and one is trying to rescue as much of the information of at least what the paintings and sculptures were before they are destroyed. And this is effectively what we're doing is we're going into these habitats and we're collecting specimens and we're archiving individual specimens that represent species that are present in the natural habitats. And in 150 years' time, 200 years' time, who knows whether those species will still exist. I think one of the things that people struggle with when they come into a museum or when they see the numbers is just the the sheer volume of insects, if you like, that we collect as part of science. How would you justify to someone who looks at a tray like this and and feels sort of disgusted, if you like, at the loss of life? It's a difficult question. It's important, I think, to emphasise the value that a collection like this has and offset that against the loss of individual insect lives. I mean, all of us in this business, we love insects. We don't like killing things. Nobody actually enjoys going out and killing things. But in terms of numbers, the amount of insects that we collect on an expedition is fewer than are killed on the windscreen of your car if you drive from London to Edinburgh in the summer. If the habitat's in good condition and it's not degraded, Insects exist in enormous numbers because they're at the bottom of the food chain. Everything eats them. Insects are robust to predation, and this is really just a form of predation. The number of entomologists in the world is really very, very small compared to the number of birds and the number of people who are driving long distance. Insect collections are archives of immense scientific value. We can even dip into old specimens to analyse their DNA. But for some people, it isn't just a question of ensuring that we don't endanger species or populations with our collecting. What if individual insects suffer pain or distress? We may never know for sure, but a few researchers are now leaning towards giving insects the benefit of the doubt. In Australia, entomologist Andrew Barron and his colleague Colin Klein, a philosopher of neuroscience at the Australian National University, are making this argument. Colin Klein. In particular, what we're finding is that a lot of the kind of uh, computational machinery in an insect brain bears a striking similarity, or this is our argument, to computational machinery in the human brain, and that machinery supports consciousness in humans. Now, of course, an insect brain is much, much smaller, and in some sense, you know, an insect is not going to have a very rich inner life. But the idea that it might feel something, so it might have visual sensations, it might feel something like pain or hunger or thirst, that, I think, Andrew and I have argued this, that seems to be increasingly plausible. So what's your argument for some sort of sense of insect consciousness based on? There's a kind of two-step argument. So first, what we argue is that in the human brain, there are, so there are structures which are referred to as the midbrain. And although this is controversial, it seems that those are the structures that really support the basic capacity for consciousness in humans. Given that, and then we go and we look at the insect brain and we say, look, the kind of information integration that's going on in the insect brain seems to be very similar to what's going on in the human midbrain. How do we make that jump from looking at insect brain structures to actually making some form of statement about their subjective experience? One of the interesting things about both the human midbrain and the insect central complex and brain more broadly is a particular kind of information, integration, 
it looks like this structure integrates together information about the insect's visual world, the insect's own motion. It integrates information about bodily needs, along with stored memories. So these things come together, and it, the argument is that both in the midbrain of the human and the central complex of the insect, these things come together and give you something like, and this is metaphorical, but I think it's important, something like a first-person perspective on the world. So you get all of these things, and then that's what allows, for example, sensory information to get something like meaning for the insect. What would that mean in terms of an insect's ability to suffer pain, for example? My own opinion on this is if insects feel anything at all, and I think they do, then I think they probably feel pain. Pain, along with things like hunger or thirst, are among the very oldest and kind of evolutionarily most important sensations. Insect physiologist Shelley Adamo at Dalhousie University in Canada is not convinced by these arguments about insect nervous systems and the existence of some kind of insect mind. They do have complex neuroanatomy, so I don't want to make it sound like they have simple brains because they have complex brains, but there's nothing in their brains that looks like what we have. So that doesn't mean that they don't have subjective feeling. It just makes it a lot harder to be able to say one way or the other what they have because you can't really rely on analogous brain areas, say, in, in a mammal. If you do something to an insect which it doesn't like, say you prod it, for example, and it responds to it, it, it seems as though it might be sensing pain. But are you suggesting that we, we don't know enough about their brains, we don't understand enough to be able to say for sure that they're experiencing pain in the same way that we do? It's a complicated problem. Insects, like all organisms on the planet have the ability to withdraw from damage. So if something starts crushing its leg, it will move away and it, sometimes it'll writhe, it'll do all sorts of things. All of these behaviors that they do help the animal to survive. And it's not just that they will have reflexes, they have more than that. Those sorts of damaging stimuli have long-term effects on their behavior and can be motivators for learning. And it's that sort of evidence that started people thinking maybe they have some sort of subjective experience. The difficulty that I have with that argument is that on the other side, we now have robots and artificial intelligence and some robots, in fact, that are designed based on some of the neural principles insects use that can kind of do the same thing. And we don't think they're feeling any particular pain, even though they look like they, they mimic the type of behavior that we have when we're in pain. So I think just having behavior that looks superficially like pain behavior to us, I think is not really a very compelling argument that insects themselves have some sort of subjective experience because we have counterexamples. We see insects doing amazing things, but do we also see insects doing things that really make us question whether or not they're feeling pain or suffering in any way? Well, we certainly do see behaviors that make us wonder, at least in some species, whether they, they feel pain or that they're their concept of pain must be very different. So, for example, some insects will continue to use a damaged limb, so they'll continue to try to walk on the, the stump of a leg. Grasshoppers have been shown to be continue to eat while something's eating them from the other end, so the, the praying mantis chewing them on one end and they're chewing on grass at the other end. And cockroaches and, and a few other insects, if you open them or they get damaged, they will eat their own innards. I've even seen that myself with cockroaches. It's sort of disturbing, but they will. And, and that's something that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in animals that have a, a keen sense of distress, I would think. I think I have to agree that eating your own guts doesn't seem a promising sign of sentience. But what if we can't completely rule out the possibility that insects are sentient? Should we be rethinking how we treat them? Colin Klein again. A philosopher Bob Fisher has argued that even if there's a sense in which there's only a very small chance that insects are conscious, the fact that we kill so many of them ought to give you at least a little bit of pause. I'm not sure what the consequences of this are. You know, I'll be honest, I still readily kill cockroaches. I have been trying to be better about shepherding spiders out, even the really nasty Australian ones. I mean, one way that I've been thinking about it, at least for researchers, is that Insofar as something is conscious, it does give you at least, or you ought to have at least something like an attitude of reverence sounds quite strong, but at least respect or appreciation. This sentience question is one of the ones that dominates a lot of the legal 
approaches to animal welfare. So whether something suffers pain or not is an important question, I guess, but I actually don't think it's the biggest question when it comes to invertebrate life. Matt Shardlow of Bug Life. His point is that all of us should respect insects regardless of whether they're conscious or not. I think some of it is about respect for other organisms. Now, whether they feel things the same way as us or not, I think, to some level, is actually an irrelevance. The fact is that that these are animals that are existing on the planet that have actually quite similar needs and basic modes of operation that we have. And at that basic level, I think they should be respected. Where does that fall down? Well, things, for instance, like the celebratory stuff with people in forests being forced to eat, you know, all sorts of grubs. That is demeaning not just for the individual involved. It's demeaning for the invertebrates. You know, these are important animals. They maintain the balances of ecosystems. They recycle waste into new life. And, and here they are getting treated on a game show for light entertainment. And, and that sort of level of disrespect I, I find problematical. As for Sussex University's Dave Goulson, if he could bring in new rules or laws to protect insects, they wouldn't be focused on the welfare of individuals they'd be about safeguarding populations in the wild. Insects receive almost no protection of any sort, unlike most other larger forms of wildlife. So, for example, there is nothing to stop you going outside and catching and killing as many butterflies as you like, unless they're formally listed as as an endangered species. And... In the whole world, there are only a handful of insects that that are on that list, um, simply because nobody really pays much attention to insects. The lists of endangered species are all birds and mammals and so on. I guess it reflects our innate biases. You know, we value big furry or feathery things more than we do little insects, which, which is a shame because one can make a pretty good argument that insects are more important, at least in terms of what they do in the environment, than some of these larger creatures that we seem to care more about. Entomologists with their killing jars might seem like relics of the Victorian age. But with insects under threat, finding out more about what species are out there and their numbers has never been more important. And to do that, sadly, we do have to kill some to discover the impact we're having on these vital but disrespected animals. One thing's certain, entomologists don't put insects in the killing jar lightly. But we do make sure we extract every last ounce of value from the lives we take.